Funke. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're here today to introduce the Minnesota People Over Parking Act. I want to say thank you all so much uh, for taking the time this morning to join us as we introduce this. And I want to thank our supporters also and our congresswoman for joining us uh, this morning. Um, if we pass this bill, uh, we're going to turn Minnesota into a true leader on housing affordability and climate action. Uh, this bill would fully eliminate uh, minimum parking mandates statewide. Uh, for anyone who might not know what that is, a minimum parking mandate is a requirement that whenever someone builds a new building or renovates an old one, they are forced to build a certain number of parking spots, uh, whether they need them or not. These mandates are often completely arbitrary. For example, let's take how two suburban cities in Minnesota re uh, regulate bowling alleys. In Carver, for every bowling lane in a, that a bowling center has, they have to have two parking spots. In Anoka, for every bowling lane, they have to have seven parking spots. Yep. Why is it two spots per bowling lane in one city and seven in a different one? Are bowlers driving three and a half times as much in Anoka as in Carver? No. These mandates often also force people to build far more parking than they need. And they are especially burdensome to renters. According to the census, 48% of renter households in Minnesota have one car, and 19% of renter households have no cars at all. So for 67% of Minnesota renter households, they either have one car or zero. But the large majority of cities in Minnesota have mandates that require between one and a half and two and a half uh, spots per unit. So they are essentially mandating a lot more parking than renters need. Those parking spots are also very expensive. The average parking spot in Minneapolis costs well over $40,000 to build. And that cost gets passed on in the form of higher costs in goods, services, uh, food, and for rent. But when people have the ability to decide for themselves how much parking they need, they can save a lot more money. A renter can save between $200 and $300 per month if they have one less parking spot. Parking mandates also often Parking mandates also often make projects completely impossible. Uh, for example, in my district, District 62, just last week, there was a church that announced it was going to convert its building into affordable housing. And that conversion would have been completely impossible if Minneapolis hadn't eliminated minimum parking mandates because there would have been nowhere to add all of the parking. Excessive parking also has a devastating impact on the environment. There's pollution from all the asphalt, runoff pollution into our waterways, and, more, and most importantly, pollution from all the extra driving. Excess parking mandates cause people to drive more in two different ways. First, people are forced to build parking that incentivizes people to drive. If people have the ability to opt out of that cost and save money, they often choose a different mode of transportation. Second, parking mandates cause more driving because they make destinations further apart since there's so much par extra parking taking up space in between. When buildings are closer together, like say in a downtown Main Street, uh, Main Street uh, it's a lot easier to walk. And I want to be clear about what this bill does and does not do. This bill does not prohibit people from building new parking spaces if they want to. It does not mandate the removal of exist any existing parking. But what it does do is allow entrepreneurs, uh, builders, customers and tenants uh, the ability to decide themselves how much parking they require at their homes, businesses, and destinations. Some people are going to oppose this bill because they don't want cities to lose local control over this issue. Uh, but to that, I would say that cities have only ever had the authority to enact zoning laws because the state delegated that power to them 100 years ago in the 1920s. From that start, the state has always set parameters on how cities could enact those zoning laws. And we have adjusted those parameters over time. So it is entirely appropriate for us to adjust those parameters once again to respond to two of the greatest crises of our time, the housing affordability crisis and the climate crisis. Minimum parking mandates are terrible for both. This bill is a step toward making housing a human right while protecting the environment that benefits 
uh, to the benefit of us all. We need our policies to focus more on building housing for people, not more housing for cause, cars. So thank you, and I would like to introduce my sister, uh, first up, Congresswoman Elhan Omar, who has been a leader on this issue ever since she was a policy aide in City Hall and is now co-sponsoring the national version of the People Over Parking Act. Please help me welcome Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. I'm not as tall as the senator, so <laughs> let's see how we can make this work. Can you all hear me? All right, well, thank you, uh, Senator Fata, for inviting me to join you today. Back in 2015, a member of the Minneapolis Planning Commissioner stopped by Minneapolis City Hall to drop off copies of the book, The High Cost of Free Parking. I was working as an aide to City Council member Andrew Johnson at the time, and I took the Planning Commissioner, Chris Meyer, to meet each council office and drop off the book. Minneapolis went to eliminate minimum parking requirements around transit stations in 2015, and then finally eliminated them citywide in 2021. I am excited to see Senator Fata carrying that work forward in the Minnesota Senate with the Minnesota People Over Parking Act. Most people don't realize how expensive minimum parking requirements are. The average parking lot at a new apartment building costs over $40,000 to build. That's more than the minimum annual income in Minnesota. The cost of that parking spot isn't something that developers pay out of their own pocket. If a tenant isn't paying for it on the top of their rent, that cost is incorporated into their rent anyway. For people who choose not to have a car or can't afford one, that cost is often unavoidable. They are subsidizing the driving habits of their neighbors. Now, before I say the next piece, I want to say that housing costs are way too high for basically everyone. As a society, we need to do everything that we can to make housing accessible, affordable, and healthy for everyone. That said, researchers have shown that eliminating parking requirements is one of the reasons why Minneapolis, Minneapolis's housing costs have not grown as quickly as other cities, all while our population has grown. If we make every apartment $40,000 cheaper to build, it will be much cheaper to rent that apartment. Parking requirements are also take up a lot of space. The average amount of 1.5 parking spots for basically two bedroom apartments requires the same space as a studio apartment. Eliminating these mandates, mandate min mandatory minimums, not only makes housing cheaper, but it makes it possible to build more housing on that same amount of land. In the Minnesota House, I was proud to join Representative Robert Garcia in introducing the People Over Parking Act, which would do what Minneapolis did back in 2015, eliminating parking requirements near transit. As the country deals with record housing costs, we need to use every tool available to make more housing, to make more housing affordable. Lastly, I want to touch on what some opponents of these bill might say. That big buildings need parking, that people want to drive. These bills will not stop new apartment buildings from building parking. If a, develop, if a developer wants to build parking because their tenants want parking, they are free to do so. What these bills do is put this decision back into the hands of tenants and builders. Minneapolis is one of the few cities that has grown in population while reducing the overall amount of driving that is taking place. Minneapolis residents are ditching their cars in favor of biking or riding the bus. And we should recognize this reality as we design cities that, that work for people instead of cars.
And I want to end by telling a story about the man who has brought us here. Uh, Chris Myers, who's a group friend of mine, who's on the planning commission in Minneapolis, who I think is probably the next speaker. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take it from Omar and introduce yes. Chris Myers. Okay. Um, it's actually wonderful to see so many people here. I've never met anyone that is excited about parking <laughs> <laughs> than, than Chris Myers. No parking. There you go. Um, I met Chris in 2012, about 12 years ago now. And in every single meeting we were in, whether we were talking about politics, whether we were talking about the divestment movement, whether we were talking about whatever it was, over coffee, he could not stop talking about eliminating parking. <laughs> I literally would ask me where I parked, if I drove, how easy it was to find parking, how easy it would be to build something else in that space. I literally was trying to avoid this man for a while because I did not want to talk about parking. <laughs> and so when I went to City Hall, he called constantly being like, when are you going to set up an appointment <laughs> to take me around to talk to other city council members? Because Andrew Johnson was also subjected to these conversations about parking as well um, because we both worked on the campaign. So it is an, actually an honor um, and a delight uh, to join my friend here today to introduce him and to see him, his advocacy reach the state level and Congress. Chris Myers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you, Senator. I'm, I'm so glad you could be here and didn't get stuck in DC for a government shutdown. <laughs> so, when I first read this book, this is my copy, it's, it's pretty worn, read it several times, I was captivated right from the start because as soon as you're reading the book, you learn so much information and there were so many problems that became apparent why they were happening, why the United States is so different from other places around the world, and they didn't used to be. We used to have lots of streetcars. Up, up until around the 1940s, we had about the same level of public transit use um, and the same level as fossil fuel consumption as uh, the EU countries um, at, at the time. Where we diverged uh, was in the 50s. Part of it was because of the highways that were built out of the general fund, so that made it hard for rail and, and streetcars to compete. Uh, but another really big part was minimum parking mandates. They strongly incentivized people to drive. Uh, they made it less pleasant to walk because there was so much extra space in between and have caused just so many problems. And that's why now uh, in the United States, we have about twice as much uh, vehicle miles traveled as the European Union countries do. It's not because people want that. A lot of people would choose other modes of transit if those options were on a fair playing field. But cities have been forcing people to build so much parking, whether they, they need it or not, that it has become you know, enormously subsidized. 99% of all car trips begin and end in a free parking spot. And you don't have a choice to opt out of that. So if you want to save money on your rent, like you don't have that option in most places. So I have been talking to anyone I could. <laughs> like, I, I kept thinking, how can I get people to pay attention to this issue. So I started um, by, by lobbying my friends, of course, and then buying 13 copies of the book, one to deliver to each Minneapolis council member, and it worked. <laughs> we got them eliminated. Thank you. We got them eliminated around transit stations in 2015. We were the first city in the United States to do that. And like, Looking like now, everyone agrees. Like I, I, I see hardly any people, you know, trying to reverse that decision. But at the time, that was a really courageous thing for the city to do. And other cities around the country started following us. Chicago copied us, and then other cities went even further than us. Buffalo, New York, and Harvard, Connecticut. They went on and, and eliminated them them altogether, and it's become a true national movement. Uh, so I'm going to try to do the same thing again. <laughs> um, 
This is what $3,000 worth of the book, The High Cost of Free Parking, looks like. It's bending that table down there. Hopefully it won't fall on us. <laughs> uh, I wanted to do more. I wanted to get 202 copies, one for each legislator and the governor. I'm falling short of that, I think I have about 130 or so. Um, so some of the legislators will have to share. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I really hope they, I mean, I'd love if they read the whole thing. I know they might not have the, the time to do that. It would be great if people would even just read the first chapter. We've got some summaries of it. Um, and for some of the people um, who are you know, not in support of this, at least not yet, I really do encourage you to, to, to look at this because I believe that understanding this issue properly will persuade you. Like I know hardly anyone uh, who thoroughly understands this issue, who has taken the time to read all of this and understand all the problems that minimum parking mandates create and the solutions that we have to adapt to that. I mean, it's clear that we need to make this change, regardless of your ideology, across the spectrum. Everyone should oppose wastefulness, and that is what this is causing. Um, for everyone else, you know, everyone who supports this, I would ask you to talk about it <laughs> you know, to your friends, to anyone who will listen to you, do your best. And you know, they should care about this if they care about climate action, about housing affordability, uh, about health care, you know, helping people get exercise built into their everyday lives. There are so many things that this change would, would help with. And the conversation that I've had with a lot of people, a lot of legislators, uh, I haven't had a single legislator express opposition yet, um, but a lot of them are saying, this sounds like good policy. I'm not sure if my constituents are there yet. We need to change that. We need to educate people as broadly as possible to talk to your friends and you know, advocate for this on every level. You know, push for your city to adopt the same reform. Push for statewide legislation. And for, for anyone from many other, other states, try to get in your, in your state too, and the federal legislation as well. And encourage policymakers to be ambitious, to be courageous, because that's what we need to do to address, address climate change and housing affordability. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you all. So Chris, Chris, as you can see, is extremely uh, passionate about this. This is his extremely worn out copy of the book with notes on every single page. So he's been working really hard to study and also uh, champion this cause. So thank you, Chris. Um, next, we have uh, Rick Varco, who is the political director of SCIU Healthcare uh, of Minnesota and Iowa, uh, to speak about why the issue is so important for working families. So please help me welcome uh, Rick Varco. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Rick Varco. I am the political director for Service Employees International Union Healthcare Minnesota and Iowa. We represent about 50,000 Minnesota healthcare workers. They work in hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, and self-directed home care. All of them would like to pay less for housing. It does not help when their local government forces them to pay for, some, for empty parking spaces they don't want or need. Eliminating government-mandated parking minimums is a pro-worker position. For most working families, housing is their biggest family expense, yet in too many places, housing costs are exploding. Union contracts with great pay increases can be undercut when your rent goes up just as fast. Eliminating parking minimum, minimums will help reduce the cost of housing because people won't have to pay for pricey land and expensive construction required by such mandates. Many of our members work at hospitals, clinics, and other major healthcare settings precisely because they are on reliable transit routes. This allows them to save on the cost of a car. They could save even more on rent, but only if they were allowed to find housing that did not include the extra cost created by government parking mandates. Local government should not be able to force them to pay for expensive and unwanted parking. That is why my union has been active on this issue for many years. Almost a decade ago, we testified in support of then Council Member Lisa Bender's proposal to eliminate parking minimums along transit corridors in Minneapolis. 
Later, we testified in support of more comprehensive reforms that el eliminated all parking mandates in Minneapolis. Just months ago, we testified in support uh, when St. Paul did the same thing. Economic experts acknowledged that the parking reforms were a major reason why Minneapolis has been able to grow their housing su supply so dramatically. This has helped keep rents more affordable than in other areas. Additional housing in Minneapolis helps lower rents throughout the metro area. This is like a huge pay increase for our members. My union looks forward to supporting this bill to eliminate parking mandates. It makes housing more affordable for our caregivers. It fights climate change by reducing our dependence on cars and gas. It allows low-income people more access to the employers with the best job opportunities and communities with the best public services. This is a bill where members of both parties can come together to support working families. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next up, we have Chuck Marone, uh, who is the author of several books, and he is uh, the founder and president of Strong Towns. Uh, strong Towns is a national organization dedicated to creating strong local communities by supporting smart, fiscally responsible policies. Um, I'm very proud to say that this is the first uh, piece of legislation that Strong Towns has ever endorsed. Uh, they normally do not get involved in specific uh, legislation, but they felt that this one uh, was special enough to get an exception. So I'm honored by that. I'm humbled by that. Thank you so much. How me welcome Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and that is true. And I am very proud to be here today. I, I don't know. It, Strong Towns has grown to be this uh, very large organization. Uh, but 15 years ago, in a very humble way, we began here in Minnesota. And many of you may be familiar with our Black Friday parking initiative that we've done now for over a decade, where we crowdsource people to go out on the busiest shopping day of the year and take photos of parking lots. And over and over and over again, we show around the country, around Minnesota, I do this in Brainerd every year, there's way more parking than what we actually need. We have mandated an absurd amount of parking. And I know Donald Shoup, uh, he is a very good man. Uh, this book is a genius book. If, you, if this is intimidating in size to you, I'll summarize it for you in a tweet. Uh, <laughs> the parking standards that dominate our codes and restrictions at the city level today are pseudoscience that came out of a, a, a snapshot of suburban expansion in the 1950s and are not applicable to cities generally today. I, I want to give you three short stories about how parking mandates have impacted and continue to impact cities, small businesses, Minnesotans. Um, there are, and, and this happens every day, I'm going to tell you this happens every day somewhere, a, a, a person has an idea for a small business. They, they are the kind of person that we want to celebrate, the kind of person who, whether they are an, an immigrant or a poor person or someone with just a vision and a dream, they have an idea of something they want to do. They go and they find a building, they develop their business plan, they maybe get a little bit of backing and support, whatever they need to get off the ground, and then they go down to City Hall and they ask for their permit, and they're told everything is great except you need to provide five more parking spots, eight more parking spots, 12 more parking spots to make this work. Why? It's in an existing building, an existing neighborhood. My clients are gonna walk, they're gonna bike, they're gonna get here other ways. Why do I have to do this? That's what the rules say, that's what the rules are. And so in order to put that business up, you have to buy an adjacent business, tear it down to build a parking lot. This is unworkable and it literally kills entrepreneurship and small business innovation. Every day in every city, big and small, this is happening all over the place. Number two, and this is an example close to home for me, um, a church wants to add a gathering place. Uh, you've got a congregation, and it would be really nice for people to be able to meet after service. Maybe if there's a wedding, for people to be able to meet beforehand or afterhand. If there's a funeral, uh, people to be able to sit around. A lot of older churches don't have this. So they go in, and they're like, we just want to put this little addition on. We're not increasing the size of our congregation. We're not increasing the size of our services. We're just expanding what is being offered to our, our, our parishioners. Nope, can't do it without 20 additional parking spaces, about 40 additional parking spaces. Requiring the church to buy up homes in the neighborhood, tear them down in places where we need housing in order to provide parking. My own church went through this and did this in Brainerd. Uh, 
Uh, third uh, little example, we do have a housing crisis. We need more housing, and we need more housing at the low end of the cost spectrum. We need to build lots and lots more of this. We have a situation across Minnesota where particularly uh, retirees are house rich and cash poor. They have extra bedrooms, but not enough money to pay their taxes, to service and maintain the house. We need to have easier systems for them to take that extra bedroom and make it into an efficiency apartment, to take that extra backyard space and make it into a cottage. When they have to go to City Hall and say, yep, here's all the requirements you have to meet, and then on top of that, you have to provide two, three, four additional parking spaces, it becomes an unnecessary burden to doing something essential and urgent in our cities. Parking mandates, and, and we've talked a little bit, and this book is brilliant, and we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of tense, uh, maybe pushback we anticipate around some of this. I, I want to give a tiny bit of historical perspective, because if we go back to that post-World War II boom, there was a, uh, let's just call them series of best practices that the state of Minnesota encouraged cities to do. The federal government encouraged cities to do. These are the things that uh, progressive kind of get out in front of the growth and development kind of places would, would institute. Uh, large school campuses being one, uh, large parking lots being another. And we literally as a state encourage cities to adopt these standards. A lot of cities have recognized the folly, and a lot of cities have backed off from that. My city of Brainerd has done some tweaks, but those tweaks were done at extremely high cost. A full year and a half of meetings and debates and public hearings and animosity building up. The reason I'm here supporting this legislation, not just because this is core to what Strong Towns is about. It's one of our five priority campaigns, eliminate parking mandates. And I will stand with anybody from any political persuasion that is ready to do that. But this legislation is about getting cities unstuck. It's about allowing them to move on. Uh, that process of change at the local level it, cities can do this on their own, but it's hard. It's extremely difficult. It takes a high toll and a high price. And quite frankly, we need our cities working on more urgent things, more difficult things. This is a silly abstraction that we are left with from the 1950s, and it's time to move on from it. This legislation will get cities unstuck. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I hope it passes the legislature unanimously and gets signed into law. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much. And yes, let's get our cities unstuck. So thank you. Uh, last, we have uh, Tony Jordan, uh, who is the president of the Parking Reform Network. Uh, the Parking Reform Network is a national organization with extensive expertise about parking policy. If people have any questions about how to solve parking issues, they are the ones to talk to. So please help me welcome Tony. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the Parking Reform Network is an organization with a mission to educate the public about the impact of these policies on issues we care about. We've got over 500 members around the country that are people just like Chris and myself who can't stop talking about parking. <laughs> so minimum parking mandates, what we're talking about, are ridiculous and outdated. Most of them were determined more than 40 years ago, before the internet, before rideshare apps, before remote work. But increasingly, cities are taking action on this. Over the last five years, more than 50 cities in the United States have joined St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Duluth in eliminating minimum parking requirements citywide for all uses. In November, Austin, Texas became the largest city in the United States to eliminate their parking mandates. So why does Austin, Minnesota still have on its books today a requirement that if you build a parking garage, you have to provide one space in the garage per employee of that garage. What does that even mean? <laughs> like, you can't make these up. You can't make them right. You just have to get rid of them. You can't wait for more transit or fewer cars or any other contrived precondition to act because parking mandates prevent quality transit. They reinforce car dependency. They encourage more traffic. When you want to grow a garden, you got to remove the rocks and weeds first. That's what this does. This is just the first, it removes the first barrier to building 
the places that people already prefer to live, work, and recreate in. Often our favorite places exist only because they were built before these mandates were in place. The reason for this is that great places with opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs can't exist if it's illegal to open a coffee shop without a parking lot that's three to five times bigger than the building that the coffee shop is in. Cities don't change overnight. A new apartment building can take years to plan, finance, permit, and construct. But you can look to early adopters of these reforms, cities like Buffalo, Seattle, Minneapolis, where studies have, done, have been done that show that when you do these reforms, more buildings do get built, they contain more homes, and most of them actually still contain off-street parking. So instead of mandates, there are many strategies and options to manage parking that cities can take. They can do parking benefit districts, which allow a city to price the curb to make sure that there's one space available at almost all times on every block, and then reinvest that money for local improvements. There are apps and platforms coming online constantly that allow existing parking to be used more efficiently or connect parkers, help them find a space when they need one. And the Parking Reform Network is here to help connect your city planners with those solutions. So this is a watershed moment. Senator Fata, your bill is the first real effort to get this type of reform passed statewide. And I know it's not gonna be the last. I'm proud to announce that as of today, the Parking Reform Network will be launching a new effort to eliminate minimum parking requirements statewide in all 50 cities across the country. Thank you, Senator, for your courageous leadership on this issue and for setting a model for the rest of the country to follow. Uh, thank you so much. And, um, and I would like to say that that's already happening. Just this last 24 hours, we've had legislators from uh, across the country uh, reaching out to our office, uh, expressing interest in putting forward similar legislation in their states. So uh, we're really excited about this. Um, so today we've just heard from a handful of supporters uh, who, uh, of this bill, uh, and there are many, many uh, more people who are passionate about this. Among the organizations that have formally endorsed the bill are the Sierra Club, uh, Move Minnesota, MN350, uh, Housing First Minnesota, uh, Neighbors for More Neighbors, the Minnesota Housing Partnership, Our Streets Minneapolis, and Sustain St. Paul. And that list is uh, quickly growing. Um, so representatives uh, from those groups are also here with us uh, today. And we are uh, blessed and happy to have many experts uh, here with us as well. So we'd be happy to answer uh, any questions from you all. When we question about uh, why this needs to happen on a statewide level. Uh, we, we heard Austin and Frater get brought up. Um, can somebody here explain why uh, we need to get rid of this for the whole state and not just leave it to uh, municipalities where there's a really strong need or desire for getting rid of uh, these mandates? What you saw? Yes, but statewide. Yeah, so the example here. You can answer actually. Go ahead. Yeah, so minimum parking requirements are have a negative effect regardless of the situation. You know, um, whether it's a small town or a, a suburb or, or a central city. Um, in places that are more car oriented, um, where people are more dependent on that, the builders are going to know that they need to build a certain amount of parking and, um, in order to attract customers. But up right now, a lot of um, city requirements are forcing them to build in excess of what they need, regardless of the situation. So a lot of suburbs have requirements of, of 2.0 and 2.5 uh, parking spots per unit. Um, as Senator Fate mentioned, um, you know, most Minnesota renters don't have two cars. Their households don't. Right? So um, even in a place that's completely car dependent, um, it doesn't make sense to set the parking requirement um, at an arbitrary level because you're still forcing more of it to get built. And you know, I, I'm from a small town, Sturgis, South Dakota, it's about 6,000 people. Um, we have a really nice downtown Main Street. That uh, type of Main Street, with you know, the classic buildings you know, close together, is illegal to build in most cities with parking mandates today uh, because you'd have to have too much parking in between. <laughs> So regardless of uh, the circumstance, it just doesn't make sense to, to force people 
to build parking that they don't need, people should decide for themselves. Yeah, and I just want to make it really clear before our next question that uh, we're not eliminating parking. Uh, we are simply saying uh, leave it to the builders and the customers and the people to make the decisions, decision about how much parking uh, is needed. with pretty much the same point, that no parking is going to get taken away anywhere. Uh, builders can still build as many parking spaces as they feel their building is going to need. And I think I heard Chuck clearly say that a really important strategic reason uh, for, for passing this bill statewide is that in order to do the campaigns to educate the public of the huge benefits of this legislation, uh, would take an enormous amount of effort in every city across Minnesota. So if we can do it with one statewide campaign like this, then cities are free to develop. When might we expect to see this hit the floor? I mean, is this going to be like a first day of session type thing? Is the language written on this? What does this look like? Yeah, so the, the bill has is, uh, been drafted where, so the hopper, or the, when the bill gets drafted will be, uh, the hopper opens January 29th, and we've been speaking to legislators about uh, their support, and we're hoping to um, get a hearing with this soon. We've spoken to some of the chairs of the committees that we expect uh, this uh, bill to go through. So, And copies of the bill are in the back as well. Uh, Park Board member Becky Alper is in the back. She has the copies of them, so thank you, Becky. Would, would this allow uh, existing housing units to, I guess, re retroactively remove parking, um, or would this only be applicable to like newly built units, that sort of thing? It would allow retroactively. Like yeah, for renovation. Yes, correct. Yep. I want to speak to about Yeah, um, one more thing we just wanted to add about the success story of, of Minneapolis is that in, in part because of the parking reforms that we passed, um, we saw a huge growth in population. We saw a lot more buildings get built. Um, we saw um, over, an, over, over a period there was an a, a increase in population of 18%. At that same time, there was a reduction in vehicle miles traveled of 2%. That is an enormous feat, we're essentially accomplishing more people with fewer cars, which is exactly what you need to do to address climate change. Do you have a house sponsor for the bill? Is there someone in the house sponsoring this bill? Uh, we're speaking, to, we have spoken to several members that have uh, expressed um, interest in uh, authoring the bill, so we expect um, uh, the bill to max out in authorship, but uh, we're still speaking to several members that are interested in chief authoring the legislation. I think next question. I represent the Minneapolis Business Alliance, and we've seen um, the opposite true. We've actually done extensive research in our population growth or decline, and Minneapolis has actually declined. Um, we're having some serious issues right now on Hennepin Avenue and Lindale Avenue with lack of access to our businesses. And what we're seeing, um, Judy Longbottom owns a UPS store in Minneapolis, for example, and she also owns the next closest store in Edina. And what she's seen is her clients are so frustrated with lack of parking that they're driving to the outskirts. People who live in our city are driving to the outskirts to get to where they need to be. Um, to get their services done because we don't have access in our city. Right now, the businesses on Lindale are being threatened by the removal of parking. And I'd like to ask everybody in the room, who got here today in their vehicle? I mean, this is a reality that we still need. I agree that not every project needs um, to have this huge analysis on parking, but I think it should be a case-by-case -case basis. I think we need balance in our city. This is a really important thing. Thank you so Thank much you. for your comment. I really appreciate that. And thankfully, this will be able to allow people to address their concerns on a case-by-case -case basis. We're not eliminating parking. We're not eliminating any parking. Uh, we're not meant. We're just saying, give the business owners, give the builders the ability to make those decisions that fit uh, their unique needs. And I think that's what this legislation does. Go ahead. So like most cities around the United States, Minneapolis did see a, a decline during the pandemic. It is coming back now. Um, okay. Um, the, I, and I can share an article 
um, that documents the, the time period when we saw that 18% growth in, in population and, and the 2% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Um, but as we've said several times, no one is stopping the businesses that you represent from building parking if they need it. We're just saying other people shouldn't be paying for it. It should be, if, if you need it for your businesses, then it should, it should be that being eliminated <laughs> right now by our streets Minneapolis and Move Minnesota with their efforts. It's, it's a serious problem right now. Next question. Has anyone put together, you know, kind of aggregated um, what parking minimums look like across Minnesota? Is there like any resources we can look at um, rather than going to each city's municipal code? So yes and no. Um, I've looked at a lot. Um, and there's a, a volunteer from my organization here who's looked at hundreds of the city, st city zoning codes. Um, and so there's no, there's no huge compilation. Like I will go and just literally pick cities alphabetically or, or randomly and look at them. Um, you know, there, there's a large, it's interestingly, there's a large amount of uniformity actually. I think back in the 50s and 40s, people, consultants would show up with like a booklet like here's, here's, like, here's your zoning code, right? Or maybe it was a state model legislation, who knows? And so a lot of them are very similar, but then they all contain their own specific tweaks. What you can do is pretty easily look at it, and for housing, for example, um, almost across the board, one and a half to two and a half spaces for a multifamily unit. You know, like some, some are more, some are a little less. So um, I don't know if we would, uh, there's some states where we have uh, partners that are looking at, you know, compiling this kind of data directly for the top 50 cities for some land uses, but like there's sometimes 50, 60 different types of land uses with very specific mandates. So it's a, it's a kind of Herculean task to really compile a big one. I could share a messy document or some, some information with you if you like, but um, it's, um, there's no set database currently. One of the major arguments for this was it's going to reduce housing costs. I mean, is there any sort of financial indicators, data uh, backing that and, and, you know, any sort of you know, numbers that you guys could give? Yeah, uh, this is Nick Erickson, Housing First Minnesota, Erickson's S-O-N. Uh, yeah, so uh, what we see is that this can add up to, you know, $40,000 to the price of a single family home. Um, so right now in Minnesota, uh, if we were to eliminate that, that actually opens up uh, new home ownership opportunities for to more than 90,000 Minnesotans. So you think about our 100,000 unit, uh, 106,000 unit housing deficit in the state. This is a critical step forward into helping us address that issue. Market rate. Just because they can build cheaper doesn't mean that they sell or rent cheaper. I mean, capitalism is like, you know, you pocket that difference, right? So if you have two apartments that are exactly the same and one contains a parking space and one does not, um, you're probably not going to be able to charge the same rent for the one that doesn't have a parking space. That prove that. I mean, would you, if you had two parking, if you had two apartments available to you, would you per, would you rent one for the same price that had a parking space that was dedicated, and one that does not? You don't need a study. This is it's it's it's. I mean, it's logical. Like parking costs money. It's often it often costs money to rent a parking space in an apartment. So if you don't have to rent it, your rent is cheaper. I have a book for you, Carol. <laughs> See the book. Awesome. You know, I've been in contact with Stu Ackerberg, Horning Group, and several organizations that have multi-buildings, that multi-unit buildings. And what they're telling me is that we don't have a shortage of, of homes right now. We have a lot of older homes that are very affordable, and they're not filling up because people are exiting the city because of the crime that we're seeing and the lack of access that we're seeing. So we do have affordable housing. So uh, this and is a uh, buildings is not going to create so it, affordable housing. New apartments actually cost more to build, and therefore the developers are going to charge more for that building. So uh, study after study shows that Minnesota has a massive housing deficit. Uh, it's it's not up for debate. Uh, I can point you to many resources that outline this. And reducing housing costs will increase housing affordability. It's uh, simple economics. Thank you all so much uh, for taking the time to join us today. And thank you for our speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, uh, for joining us. And thank you uh, for Chris Meyer, for uh, our planning commissioner, for making this possible. Um, uh, thank you for our supporters, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, SEIU, whether it's um, uh, 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 First Town, is it Strong Towns? Sorry, not First. Um, um, uh, we appreciate your support, and um, there will be pizza upstairs. Yeah, it's coming in, so it's room 2308. Yeah, room 2308. And it's coming in 1115.
Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Take care.